Yes. Yes. You're carrying a heavy rock in the photo. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So, um, hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for calling in today. I'm excited and honored to be here and be able to talk to you all today. Um, my name is Ashley Madney, and I'm an engineer at JPL. Um, today, I thought it would be fun to give you all an overview of JPL, its history, some of the missions we're working on, and then specifically talk more about the mission that I support, which is called Psyche. Um, you'll see in this photo, I'm, I'm holding a, a model, a paper mache model of the asteroid Psyche that um, this spacecraft is going to be exploring, which is definitely larger than the model that I'm holding. Um, but throughout this presentation, please feel free to ask me questions. I'm happy to talk about things more. Um, it's pretty high level. Just wanted to, you know, give you all an overview of, of NASA and our mission um, and be here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, I did want to acknowledge that I got a lot of my slides from two of my colleagues today who do a lot of outreach talks. So one of them is Dr. Randy Wesson and the other is Dr. Bill uh, William Hart. So I wanted to acknowledge that um, they graciously gave me a lot of these wonderful slides to share with you all. Um, so first I'm going to give you all a bit more background about myself, education, experiences, since you all are undergrads, maybe it'll help inform you, um, you know, me sharing my pathway to JPL um, can help, you know, give you all um, inspiration for ways that you all can, um, you know, guide your experiences moving forward. So I started off getting my undergraduate degree at WashU in St. Louis. I actually studied biomedical engineering. Um, I thought that was just a really cool field at the time. I really enjoyed the material that I learned, but about halfway through undergrad, I realized that it wasn't maybe the career path that I was very passionate about. So starting my junior year, I started looking for internships and research experiences that I could, you know, so I could kind of divert my path a little bit more into aerospace because that was something that I was always interested in. Um, so I do have a biomedical engineering degree, which is a bit odd <laughs> for a JPL engineer, um, but I think in some ways it's made me stand out um, as well and be able to support, you know, maybe human space exploration missions in the future. So then directly after undergrad, I went to CU Boulder to get my master's in aerospace engineering to kind of complete that pivot into the aerospace world. So looking at my undergrad experience, um, things that really stood out to me, I was able to, I had the privilege of being part of Injures That Borders. Um, I, I'm sure you, you know, UCLA probably has a chapter themselves. It was such a great experience, you know, in terms of leadership and technical knowledge to be part of this organization. And I felt like it gave me really good leadership experience moving forward that I could apply to, you know, future internships, et cetera. Um, my first actual, foray into aerospace was working on this NASA Super Tiger project as an undergrad. So like I said, I was a BME major. I didn't have any experience in, in space, but I attended a lecture one day by one of our, um, our um, astrophysics professors. And I went up to him after the lecture and I said, you know, I'm really interested in your research. Is there any way I could get involved? And so he, um, he hired me on as a research assistant and I got to support this mission that sent altitude, uh, high altitude balloons up into the atmosphere to look at galactic cosmic ray origins. And so this um, research experience in undergrad really helped you know, pivot into and lead the way into other aerospace experiences. Um, and so then the following summer, I had the honor of attending the NASA Ames Academy. So this is an internship um, that took place over the course of eight weeks at the NASA Ames Research Center, and I got to do some very cool space life sciences research um, and do a very fun group research project with the rest of the interns as well. So I learned a lot more about NASA during my during my experience there. And I believe this internship is now called, um, I don't think it's called the NASA Academy anymore. Um, I think it's called the Space Life Sciences Exploration Program, but if anyone's looking for internships, it's a really great one that I highly recommend. Um, and so then my final year of undergrad, I worked for a research lab at WashU studying the bone samples from mice that had flown on one of the space shuttle missions. And so what we were looking at is how the microgravity environment affects bone degradation um, while you're in space. So kind of combining my biomed and 
um, space interests all into one. So the next, I went to grad school and I was able to be part of this research lab called BioServe. And this is really cool because what we did at BioServe is build and develop space flight hardware that housed science experiments on the International Space Station. So I got to be part of the building of the hardware and going to the launch site, integrating the payloads with the, um, it wasn't the space shuttle anymore, but it was the um, SpaceX Dragon capsule that we integrated with and sent it to the space station. So that was a really fun lab to be part of. Um, and I participated in the Caltech Space Challenge, which I believe still happens every couple of years. It's really cool. It, it happens over most universities spring break period. So it's a seven day mission design competition. They select 30 students to come and take part of it at Caltech. And the, they divide the students into two teams. Um, and they basically have seven days to design an end to end space mission. Um, so it's really fun, really great experience if anyone is um, interested in applying to that for the next round. And then the other cool thing that I got to do in grad school is help out with Sierra Nevada's um, Dream Chaser vehicle. So this vehicle at the time when I was in grad school was intended to ferry astronauts to the space station. So um, I got to help, you know, come up with some preliminary designs of the cockpit and help figure out where things should go, um, what type of buttons should be there, how, how the crew members will be able to ingress and egress safely out of the cockpit and do other sort of human factors research. So a well-rounded um, grad school experience there. Out of grad school, um, I actually worked for Boeing for three years. So I was part of the systems engineering rotation program, uh, which hires a few new engineers every year out of El Segundo. Um, again, another really wonderful early career opportunity that I would recommend to anyone interested. Um, the rotation program is great because you get to spend six to nine months in one area um, of Boeing uh, defense, so typically in the satellite systems. And so you can maybe work on thermal design for six months and then mechanical and then something in electrical or systems and then just really figure out where your niche is after two to three years um, and settle there. So it was a really great experience for me. I got to support the CST-100 Starliner vehicle and also the XS-1 experimental space plane. So um, Boeing was a really great company to work for um, and I got to work on some very cool um, technical challenges while I was there. Um, but for me, space exploration has always been the dream and the goal. So um, I was fortunate enough to uh, get a job at JPL, which I've I've been at JPL for about three years now. Um, I'm in the Project Systems Engineering and Formulation Group. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm supporting the Psyche mission. So as part of Psyche's Project Systems Engineering team, um, I really do a variety of tasks. And that's kind of expected of a systems engineer. You're a bit of a jack of all trades and you know, need to be able to work really well in an interdisciplinary team um, and understand you know, what everyone's you know, push points are and what all the stakeholders really care about to come up with design solutions that satisfy everyone's requirements to the best that they can. So some of the work that I do is in terms of requirements development and management, um, leading project-wide systems trade studies. Um, I lead all of our pointing analysis for the spacecraft. So, you know, for example, if we are out at the asteroid or, you know, somewhere else, it's very important that we have precision pointing to make sure that we're you know, pointing our imagers or other instruments at the asteroid, or that we're pointing our antennas, you know, back at Earth, um, so precisely to be able to get the downlink that we need. Um, so pointing analysis has been a really cool task that I've been part of. Um, also missed thrust analysis. So the Psyche spacecraft is um, an electric propulsion mission. And in EP missions, because we're thrusting at low outputs for extended periods of time, if something happens to the spacecraft and you miss a period of time where you should be thrusting, it could throw you off course in a way that if it's for too long of a period of time, you might not even reach your intended target. So there's a whole analysis around how many days of this thrust can you accommodate? What phases of the trajectory are you most sensitive to miss thrust? Um, and so on. 
And so um, as a systems engineer, I was involved in leading that analysis effort with um, with all the our trajectory designers and EP engineers. Um, and then now the phase in the mission, we're really getting into verification and validation. So I'm working with the software engineers and the scientists to make sure that um, you know their requirements are being verified and validated, and that the engineering that we've developed will be able to accomplish the science goals that that we're intending to do. Um, other cool things about JPL is that they really encourage technical publications and attending conferences. So, in the last year, I've either been the lead author or co-author of three papers, um, which has been really cool. Um, something that was a bit new to me in industry, um, but I think that's something really cool and unique to JPL that they encourage. Um, so, just a little tidbit about systems engineering. Um, if anyone's interested, I highly recommend reading or skimming through the NASA Systems Engineering Handbook. Um, they have just a great framework for how systems engineering can be used to solve complex engineering challenges, um, not only for aerospace applications. But um, I like their definition. They say that systems engineering is defined as a methodical, multidisciplinary approach for the design, realization, technical management, operations, and retirement of a system. Um, so it's, it's really um, an art and a science. Um, to be a good systems engineer. Um, and so, you know, that role isn't for everyone, but it's something that I've really come to love and enjoy. And then the last little bit um, for my intro, the things that I've learned along the way, um, I think it's important to say yes to opportunities that come your way. And you, you, know, you never know how they're going to lead to another opportunity or at least provide valuable leadership experiences for you in the interim. Um, and I also think it's important to say yes to these opportunities because you might find out that there's things that you don't actually enjoy doing. Um, that's kind of how I discovered that I didn't want to be a biomedical engineer through experiences that I didn't like doing and, you know, how I discovered that I wanted to be a systems or a space engineer instead. Um, and so through all these, um, you know, opportunities, it's it's really important to foster relationships and, and be a team player because that's really what it's about. Um, when you get out into the workforce. Okay, so that's enough about me. Um, any questions or comments so far before I dive into my NASA spiel? Okay, so um, you all may know that there are actually 10 NASA centers um, across the country. So um, they all are responsible for different things. Um, for example, Johnson. Um, Johnson Space Center in Houston leads, you know, ISS operations and our astronaut training programs, whereas Dennis um, in Alabama does our rocket development. Kennedy Space Center is responsible for a lot of our launches. And then we have JPL over here in California, and we are responsible for most of our robotic space exploration missions. Um, the reason it's important to have robotic space exploration missions is because it can take you know, many years to reach interesting points in our solar system. You know, for example, it takes five to seven years to get to Jupiter or Saturn and getting to Pluto takes nine and a half years. Mars takes seven to 10 months. So that's, you know, more attainable for human missions. But, um, you know, robotic missions are really our key way to explore other parts of the solar system with the technology that, it, that exists today. So I wanted to give a little bit of history about JPL. Um, so it actually started in the 1930s with a group of Caltech students. So um, these students were known as the Suicide Squad. They were trying to create rocket fuel at the Caltech campus, but kept blowing things up and causing horrible fumes. So one day their professor, Theodore von Karman, asked them to relocate to the Arroyo Seco. Um, to continue their rocket testing. And then finally, on Halloween in 1936, they had their first successful rocket test. Um, and so that was the start of JPL. And if you all have seen um, on social media, JPL always does a big Halloween celebration with making crazy, um, like, mechanized pumpkins like and jack-o'-lanterns because uh, Halloween's very special to our history. 
Um, this is what JPL looked like in the 1940s, just a lot of land and dirt in the San Gabriel Mountains. And this is what it looks like today. So we have a beautiful campus um, nestled up against the mountains. Um, so here's how we kind of got started into the satellite world. So in 1957, Sputnik was launched um, and that really caused a space race. Um, and JPL was working with the military to develop our first satellite. And that's where we got Explorer 1. So Explorer 1 launched in 1958 and it was the first successful satellite launch by the United States. Um, this satellite identified the Van Allen radiation belt, which showed that charge articles um, are around our planet. Um, and then in 1958, President Eisenhower signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act, which established NASA. So at the time of NASA's formation, JPL had actually already been around for 20 years. So NASA, um, sorry, so JPL is a federally funded research and development center that is managed by Caltech um, for NASA. So it's a little different and has a slightly more autonomy than the other NASA centers. We're not government employees, we're actually Caltech employees. And this is another view of campus. Um, we have about 6,400 employees today. And I like to tell people that our campus is about the size of Disneyland. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about some of the things that JPL is responsible for. Um, and one of those things is the Deep Space Network. So JPL manages the DSN, which runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, the Deep Space Net Network consists of large 70 meter antennas spread across the globe um, so that you know, as Earth rotates, we constantly have one of these antennas in contact with the spacecraft that we have. Um, so, you know, some of them in Earth orbit, but these are mostly used for these spacecraft that are in deeper space. So in our mission control room, if you've had the privilege to tour JPL, you'll see the controllers there communicating with the DSN antennas, um, you know, sending data to the spacecraft and receiving data all in real time. So that control center is staffed 24 seven, um, it has lots of emergency and backup power systems. It, it actually is in this, I think it's on the building itself is on rollers to protect against earthquakes. So um, it's very, very important that that control center where we send and receive this information to make sure all of our spacecraft um, and the solar system are healthy, um, stays in good shape, <laughs> no matter what happens. All right, so you all might, you know, when you think of NASA, you think of JPL, you think of all the really cool planetary missions that we have, but we actually have dozens of Earth orbiting satellites um, that collect really important Earth science data. And, you know, some of the things really, one of my favorite cool Earth science missions that we have is called GRACE Follow-On. So this is a set of two satellites that orbit Earth in tandem. Um, they fly in precision formation. Um, and use microwave to communicate with each other. And so as they're flying over the earth, slight changes in earth's gravity will pull the first spacecraft slightly forward. And when that happens, the two satellites will note that there's been a difference in their distance. And in that way, they can map the gravity density across earth and, and changes in gravity. So. Um, I think that's a really cool mission that we've had for the last couple of years. But uh, everyone's favorite planet that we like to explore is Mars. Um, I think, you know, the reason Mars was our first, um, you know, that's where we had our first lander, our first rovers, our first satellites, at, you know, for another planet. Um, it's, it's close enough and similar enough to Earth to be, to be interesting and accessible. So we've had a lot of missions. Um, at Mars over the years. It's about a third of the size of Earth. And this shows all of our current and past missions and where they are on the Mars map. So um, you can see at the Jezero crater, if my mouse will point to it. Um, so this is where our next rover is landing. It's called Perseverance and it's landing in less than 30 days. And the reason they've picked this spot 
And the reason there's a lot of rovers in this area is because there's evidence of, you know, maybe past waterbeds there. And so scientists always say that if you find signs of water, you're likely to find signs of ancient life. Um, so we're really excited for that new rover to land in the next month and for what science data that's going to return. Okay, let's see if this video works. Okay, I think it is. So landing on Mars is tough because it has enough atmosphere to slow us down and, and remove a lot of the kinetic energy, but not enough to do so entirely. So um, this is a video from the MSL or Curiosity Landing in 2012. Um, you'll see that its first line of defense is using its aeroshell to you know, start gliding through the atmosphere and, and burn off some of that kinetic energy. Um, and it'll slow it down you know, maybe 30% of the way. And then next you'll see, and it's also using its thrusters to kind of reorient itself along the way. And so then when it's done as much as that can do, um, it releases its parachutes to slow it down even more. But that is still not <laughs> quite enough. And so then it's releasing its, its aeroshell just to free that out. And you might have caught the rover sitting there in the underbelly of the back shell. And so once it slows down a bit more, it releases the spacecraft and its propulsion module, which, which is kind of sitting on top of the rover right now, is lowering it um, slowly to the surface. And it's using you know, its G and C algorithms and adjustment mechanisms to fire different thrusters to maintain you know, a level sense of balance as it descends. And it even has a tiny camera, which as it gets closer to the surface, can't spot any, you know, maybe there's a giant rock or, um, or maybe there's a cliff that it wants to avoid. So it uses its camera systems in real time to um, do some maneuvering if necessary. And so then it's going to use its sky crane to descend the rover slowly to the surface. And then you'll see the cables um, be cut and disconnected. And the propulsion module will fly away rapidly because we, A, don't want it to fall on top of the rover. And B, we want it to go far enough away so that it doesn't impede any of the terrain we're planning to cover you know, as we rove around on the surface. So it just flies as far away as possible um, and crashes somewhere else. And then we're left with the rover on the surface to begin science operations. So that was a novel concept that we developed back in 2012 and we'll be using again on the Perseverance rover. And I think it's 28 days from now it's landing. So that'll be really exciting. Okay, I just love this photo of Mars because it looks like something that we would see here on Earth. Um, we've been able to get such amazing images back from our rovers up there. Um, so talking about some other cool uh, Mars mission, um, the MAVEN spacecraft is an orbiter around Mars that's investigating what happened to the Martian atmosphere. So, um, you know, it, its goal is to look at um, information from the solar winds um, and see how it may have stripped the atmosphere away from Mars over time. So that mission is ongoing. Um, and then we're also looking at, you know, investigating whether Mars is geologically active. And so this was the science goal of the InSight lander, which landed about two years ago um, and is still active on the surface today. Um, since its landing, it's detected that hundreds of Mars quakes um, have actually happened and, and have been recorded. So that's really cool to know that Mars is still a geologically active planet. Now, you might have heard about our instrument called the MOLE. Um, so the mole is a um, heat probe that was designed to bury itself about three feet into the surface and measure changes in temperatures. Um, what happened is that the mole was designed to use friction from the dirt to propel itself downward, but the regolith on the surface was actually a lot finer than we had anticipated. And so there wasn't enough friction for it to bury itself as intended. And so engineers at JPL spent about a year troubleshooting 
with our own mock-ups, trying to figure out how we could maybe use what we have or try different methods or send different commands to try and get the probe to, to work and bury itself. We even tried using our scoop on robotic arm to press on top of it to provide some pressure. But unfortunately, um, those efforts did not succeed. So um, recently we, we declared that the mole is no longer a viable science instrument, which is definitely a bummer. Um, but we have other really great science instruments on the stagecraft as well that are providing great data. So here's the next rover in line, Perseverance, that I said is, is landing, let's see, February 18th. So mark your calendars. Um, it'll be really exciting to see the science that this one returns. So this one is primarily looking at science for ancient microbial life. And a couple of cool things it's going to do, um, it's actually going to be taking samples of Martian rock and regolith. Um, and burying them into the surface for a future Mars sample return mission to collect and return to Earth. And that's a mission concept slated for maybe 2026 is the last that I saw. Um, but it's preparing for future such missions. Um, it's also gonna be testing whether we can produce oxygen from the Mars atmosphere, which you know could be used in future human Mars missions um, because the atmosphere on Mars is mostly carbon dioxide, you know, and we can't necessarily bring all the oxygen that we need to sustain life, human life on Mars for an extended period of time. Um, it would be really helpful to come up with a technology that can convert carbon dioxide to, uh, you know, breathable oxygen for the astronauts. Um, so that'll be a really interesting technology demonstration that's part of this mission. But I think one thing that a lot of people are excited about is that it's going to be testing out a Mars helicopter. So on the underbelly of the rover is actually a small helicopter. So it's going to drop it off and back away. And then the helicopter, it, it's quite small. I'll show you a, a picture of it and test at the end of this video. But um, the purpose of the helicopter would be to be able to scout other interesting sites in advance for the rover to drive itself to, you know, sites of interest that the scientists want to explore and also detecting if there's any obstacles along the way. Um, so this would be the first time that we've ever flown a helicopter on another planet, um, which is pretty cool. And designing it was pretty difficult actually, um, because like I said, the atmosphere on Mars is different, it's thinner. And so, you know, how we typically design rotorcraft on Earth, it doesn't necessarily work in a different sort of atmosphere. So this is a video of the copter being tested inside a vacuum chamber, which we pumped down to mimic the atmospheric conditions on Mars. And it took many iterations <laughs> to get this right. But um, we're really excited to see how this does when it, when it lands on Mars soon. What's the fuel that the uh, helicopter uses? That's a great question. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm sorry. I don't know the answer to that question. Can't really see. Um, and so then I also, um, yeah, I, I, I don't have any notes on it. Um, I but, think that it's oh yeah, because it has solar panels on it. If I'm if I remember right, so. Hmm. Yeah, it could be. It could definitely be electric. Um, let's see. And so then we, I mentioned about the potential Mars sample return mission. So um, Perseverance is going to collect these samples. And then, you know, hopefully there'll be a future mission where we are able to return these samples to Earth. So that's the end of my Mars segment. Uh, now turning towards some of the outer planets. Any questions or things you all want to talk about um, at this point? One more question about the helicopter. So is that um, autonomously flying or is that somehow being controlled from, from Earth? I believe the way it works is that um, the science and mission planners will upload the commands to it in advance and tell it exactly where to fly. And then once we receive the data, we'll see what it saw 
and, um, you know, be able to tell it where to go next. So I think, you know, during flight, it's autonomous, but we tell it where to go, but it controls itself autonomously in real time. It's very cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very cool. I'm really excited to see how it works. And then hopefully, um, you know, we can use this for maybe helicopters on Venus or even, you know, larger helicopter systems on Mars once we have, you know, astronauts there. So it's it's going to be a great tech demo. I, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you say did you say perseverance when it collects the samples that uh, you event, we eventually want to bring back to Earth. Did you say it was going to bury them? Yes, I think it buries them. I mean, not like very deep, but okay. just so that it, they stay planted in the ground because Mars has a lot of weather and you know dust storms. And so we mm. want to make sure that they don't move around from the exact location where we know that we've stored them. Okay, I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah, if you've ever Googled, there's really amazing video of dust devils on Mars. Um, it looks just like a, you know, tornado <laughs> that we would have on Earth. It's very cool. Kind of curious, but what are your opinions on uh, terraforming Mars? Oh, I love that. Um, you know, I don't know how I feel about it, maybe like ethically or morally, but I it, it could be really interesting i mean i know elon musk is, is all about terraforming mars um i think it's theoretically possible i don't know it's definitely not something we would see in our lifetime it would take you know thousands of years but it would be cool you know to have another planet for us to go live on i don't know do you have any thoughts no i thought it was just kind of cool i don't know uh ethically and morally much about it but yeah <laughs> yeah i think it would be really i actually think it'd be really awesome if we could figure it out you've been able All to right, use so your bioengineering uh, background at, at gpl well i would love to um i think it'd be really cool to be part of um there's there's a mission concept at gpl for um, I mean, we're working on part of the, you know, concepts for bringing astronauts to Mars. Um, I would love to be part of the like life support system design team or, you know, the team looking at, you know, generating oxygen from the atmosphere. Um, so I'm hoping that's something I can kind of join down the line when those projects become more of a reality. Cause that's, that's what I'm most interested in is figuring out how to sustain life in space or on other planets. Um, there's not a lot of like work in that area, especially in California. But um, yeah, I'd love to eventually merge those two fields of interest into one. And hopefully in the next decade, we would be looking at seriously sending astronauts to Mars, Mars and, and working on those projects. All right, so another really um, important mission to JPL that we've been, uh, that we managed was Juno. So this was a mission to Jupiter and it just returned the most amazing photos and imagery um, back from this planet. Um, and, you know, one of the really cool things that we learned about Jupiter is just the weather and activity that this planet has on a daily basis, um, this infrared view just shows the the depth of the atmosphere and these really unusual structures we haven't seen on other planets. Um, I think scientists are still investigating exactly how this works and, and what this means and why this forms on Jupiter, but not on other planets. Um, but, you know, we're just, we continue to collect really amazing data from the Juno spacecraft on Jupiter all the time. Um, the challenge with Juno and orbiting Jupiter is that this planet emits an enormous amount of radiation. So the spacecrafts actually have to orbit it in a highly elliptical orbit so that they're spending as little time as possible close to the planet um, to protect you know, all of the um, computer elements and, and other systems that are affected by radiation and bit flips and things like that. 
Um, so it's a fascinating planet to study, but definitely has its challenges with its with its radiation environment. And an upcoming mission that JPL is working on right now is a mission to Europa. So the spacecraft and mission are called Europa Clipper. Europa is one of the moons of, Mar uh, sorry, of Jupiter. And it's believed to be an icy body with a subsurface liquid ocean. Um, and that, that doesn't mean that the ocean's made of water. It's probably not made of water, but of you know another sort of liquid. But um, this spacecraft is going to orbit um, Europa and to start collecting reconnaissance data about this moon um, to see if it could possibly harbor conditions suitable for life, you know, either on the surface or subsurface. And then the eventual goal would be to stand to the lander to Europa once we, you know, learn more about this moon and, you know, map it in a really detailed fashion with, with imagers. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that we do is look at some of the minor bodies of the solar system. So um, speaking about asteroids, you know, this, this graphic shows the number of asteroids that we've been able to detect over the years um, keeps growing and growing. <laughs> and so by this point, we've detected almost a million minor planets in our solar system. Um, about 23,000 of those are considered near-Earth asteroids. So um, I think those are the red ones kind of in this inner circle. Um, and almost 5,000 of those are potentially hazardous. So this 4,700 are the ones that astronomers are tracking really diligently um, to make sure that their future trajectories don't you know, intercept with Earth directly. Um, so another a, a recent asteroid mission that was in the news a lot is OSIRIS-REx. So this mission, which was managed by the Goddard Space Flight Center, um, actually took a sample of the surface. So what it did is a probe on the end of the spacecraft um, basically just pushed <laughs> really hard into the surface in a way that um, exploded a lot of debris. And so then it backed away really quickly and opened its arm to capture a lot of the debris that came out of that impact. Um, so it, I think there was a bit of an anomaly where it captured so much debris that it had trouble actually closing. But now the engineers have been able to successfully close that capsule and those, that sample is planned to be returned to Earth in 2023. So that will be really cool to actually have a piece of asteroid um, back on Earth for scientists to analyze. Um, I'm going to be talking more about the Psyche mission in later slides, so I'll skip this for now, but um, this is a mission I'm supporting and um, is another asteroid mission of NASA's. And then finally, you know, beyond our solar system, NASA also looks at new worlds. You know, we want to know where we came from and if we're alone in the universe. Um, and one very cool mission is called Kepler. So Kepler launched in 2009. And actually, when I was an intern at Ames in 2011, we were getting the first real science data back from this mission. So I remember it being a very exciting time where we were actually able to detect exoplanets um, for the first time in you know, a controlled and, and well-understood manner. And so how this telescope works, it's actually situated at a Lagrange point um, in the solar system. So it's, it's a very stable environment. And what it does is it stares out at specific fields of stars and it measures the brightness of the stars and how those might dim periodically over time. So if you look at this graphic, you're going to see planets passing by the star and you can see that dip in brightness. And so it, it literally just measures the brightness of the stars and the periodical dips in the brightness. And from that data and collecting it over and over again, they can infer the number of exoplanets that a star might have, the size of them, the distance of them towards the center of the star, and so forth. Um, and so since the time of this mission um, began collecting science data, it's, it initially detected about 7,500 exoplanets. And then through additional verification and, and re-imaging, um, you know, confirmed almost 4,000 of them were true and not from, you know, maybe other anomalies that it that caused the brightness to dip. Um, and then about 200 of those appear to be Earth-sized. 
and 30 of them appear to be in the habitable zone, which means that they're close enough to the star to have enough warmth to support life, but not too far away um, where they would potentially be too cold to support life. So, you know, we call this the Goldilocks zone. So, you know, it's very exciting that it looks like there might be 30 Earths out there that we've been able to find so far. And so hopefully future missions will um, be looking at these exoplanets in more detail. And one future technology, oh, sorry, that's not coming slide. Um, so some of the kind of crazy worlds that we've discovered are hot Jupiters. And so hot Jupiters are a kind of gas giant exoplanets um, that are in similar size to Jupiter, but are actually orbiting very close to their star. So their year or orbital period is less than 10 days. So that's what they're called, hot Jupiters. And we've also found some orphan worlds, so worlds that seem to have escaped the gravity of their star and are just kind of floating <laughs> through, through space. Um, and then we've detected a lot of ocean worlds um, that seem to have the right conditions to support li liquid water. So this is a new technology that's being analyzed and developed, um, not currently slated for any specific mission, but um, hopefully will be at some point soon. So this star shade would fly in tandem with the telescope um, directly in front of it to the point where it blocks out the brightest part of a star so that it could produce better images of the planets themselves. Um, oftentimes the star is so bright, you know, that's the bulk of the image that you're getting back in your capture. But if we had the star shade, you know, it would, it would dim that brightest part so you could actually see what the planets are. Um, so, you know, this is wrapping up my JPL and space exploration overview. You know, our goal is to explore the universe, understand our planet, and also ultimately using this technology that's developed to, to improve our life on Earth. Um, and so this is a cool photo of three different pictures of Earth. So one on the left you can imagine is just from maybe the space station or satellite. Next is from the moon. And the third one is actually from Mars. And way up at the top, a little dot up there is Earth. And similarly, um, this is a really amazing image that was captured by the Cassini spacecraft at Saturn. Um, and this tiny, tiny pale blue dot over here in the red circle is actually Earth. And we just look like a fleck of dust in a ring. Um, so it gives you kind of some, some perspective here. All right, so that's my, that's the end of the NASA JPL mission overview section before we dive into Psyche. Any other questions or topics for discussion here? Where, where was the asteroid that was landed on? Is that out in the beyond uh, Mars or there's an asteroid belt, I guess, out uh, Jupiter? Yep. Or yeah, so that was in the asteroid belt itself, yeah. Quite, quite far away, actually. Yeah, yeah, so I think those missions take, well, depending on the type of propulsion that your spacecraft is using, um, it's just beyond Mars. So if you were using a traditional propulsion method, it would take maybe about a year to get there. Um, a lot of these asteroid missions actually use electropropulsion because while it takes longer to get there, you're able to keep operating for a much longer period of time. So, you know, you could maybe visit multiple asteroids while you're already in the asteroid belt. So a lot of these future deep space deep missions are, are going to electric propulsion. I have another uh, question. Um, it's yeah. like, do you ever um, have to consider like special relativity in any of your technical projects? Like when you're sending hmm. stuff out? <clears throat> I don't know the answer to that. I don't think so. I think that's such a minor factor, um, but I do not know. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I have a quick question. So you mentioned that yeah. Jupiter lets out uh, radiation. You mean electromagnetic radiation or like like uh, sort of like uh, atomic radiation of some other sort like alpha or beta? Yeah, no, I believe that uh, electromagnetic radiation. Okay. All right. It's um, a highly magnetized um, 
planet with um, those with uh, really intense radiation belts. Okay. All right. Cool. And so um, through the Juno mission, we've been able to use magnetometers on the spacecraft to map out those that radiation environment um, in detail. But you know that information has played a big role in our next mission to Europa because similarly, we're going to have to fly by it in a very elliptical manner to avoid, um, you know, most of those radiation belts. Does that, does um, that If we didn't do that. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just gonna ask if the, if the large magnetic field has any effect on, on some of the uh, atmosphere. I know that, uh, you know, Earth's uh, magnetic field definitely is sort of creates some of the weird phenomena that we see. I think you talked about it earlier, the, oh, I forget what it's called, mm -hmm. the, the the just the you know particles being deflected and and things sort of being confined to our atmosphere does that sort of something does it have a greater effect on jupiter yeah i you know i actually don't know the answer to that i would imagine that it does i would imagine that it is maybe the reason why we see the strange formation at the north pole like i showed in that infrared video um but yeah, I, I don't know um, exactly how the magnetic atmosphere um, or the magnetic field contribute to the atmosphere on, on Jupiter. That's a good question. Cool. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I have a question. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, so you mentioned uh, how there's like, we, we have all these, we know the we know about all these asteroids nearby and then we have like a list of 5,000 or so that are kind of like potentially threatening to earth or whatever. Um, if we actually, or like that, that uh, scientists like watch, uh, watch over more closely to make sure that they don't intersect with earth. If, if we did find out that one of them was gonna intersect with earth, is there like anything we could do about it? Or would it just be like, well, we know. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't think there's any sort of like Armageddon plan in place at the moment. Um, <laughs> But I think, yeah, I think it's more just FYI, uh, this might be coming. You know, I don't know if, if it turned out, I mean, we can, we can map the future trajectories of asteroids pretty well. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, to a degree in the future, like numbers of years and years in the future. So I think if there was anything that, you know, scientists detected, okay, in 10 or 20 years, this is going to get very close to Earth maybe there would be some sort of plan put in place or program to, you know, go blow it up. I don't know, <laughs> but I, I don't see. think anything like that exists uh, today. I don't think there's any asteroids that are such a threat to um, directly hitting Earth that we know of. Right. So if you think it's about it, I mean, space is really big. Space is really big and there's a lot of room for everything <laughs> to have its own, you know, piece of space and especially for the smaller asteroids, you know, a lot of them would break up in the atmosphere before even hitting the ground. So the ones right. that we're really worried about have to be, you know, sizable enough. Um, and they probably wouldn't be pulled in so closely by Earth's gravity. Also, right. three quarters of Earth is covered by ocean. That's true. Yeah. So we have a two thirds chance of no major impact besides tsunamis. <laughs> I, I just remember the one that like uh, flew over, I think like someplace in Russia, like a few years ago. There were like all those videos. Yeah, that was really and, crazy. Yeah, and uh, I just remember the one thing I learned from that is if I ever see an asteroid, immediately look away because if there's glass nearby, <laughs> it'll like shoot into your eyes, so. Yeah, yeah, that was really wild. Yeah, I remember, yeah, because the impact I remember that now from even was so, so great that buildings glass was the windows were exploding. That was pretty crazy. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry to so, yeah. more. Bit, Anything but... else? <laughs> no, I love it. I love the discussion. All right. Um, so then I was going to tell you guys more about the psyche mission specifically, since this is what I work on every day at JPL. So this is a artist rendition of our spacecraft. You can see these um, five panel solar arrays on either, either side. Um, the bus in the center is about the size of a, I think we like to call it the size of a um, bus. 
well, I'm getting confused. The, we call this uh, like the chassis a bus, but it's also the size of like a yellow school bus. <laughs> um, and on top is the high gain antenna. And then you can see on, um, let me see if I can move my pointer. Um, on top, you can see some of the instruments poking out from the bus there. So let's dive into this mission. Um, so Psyche is the name of the asteroid that we're visiting and also the name of our spacecraft. Um, it is the largest metal asteroid that's been detected in the asteroid belt. It's about um, 200, 200 kilometers across, and it's believed to be anywhere between 30 and 60% metal by volume. And because it has this strong metal marking, um, we actually think that it, it could be the exposed core of a planet that was disrupted in its early planet formation. So that means you know, during the formation of the solar system, um, all these materials are colliding together and, you know, forming bodies. Um, usually the, the hot metal material forms first and kind of like melts together. And then the rocky surface follows. Um, but is it possible that while the rocky surface was still forming, other asteroids came and hit it and like a hit and run and blew, you know, the mantle surface away. And then we're just left with this exposed planetary core. Um, what's really cool about studying this body is that there's no other way to really study a planetary core. I mean, you know, we can't dig our way to the center of the earth and look at our own core. Um, and so, you know, it would provide a very unique, um, you know, testing ground to study more about like how planetary cores form, what they're composed of, et cetera. So that's why this um, asteroid is very interesting to us. Um, and then we have we have three main science payloads. So first is the imager um, to take really detailed photographs of the body and look at its topography. Um, we also have a magnetometer to study if it has a ma magnetic field, which is a big marker of whether it's actually a planetary core, if it has some um, you know, magnetic field lines. And then the gamma ray neutron spectrometer will tell us the elemental abundances um, and what the core is actually, or what the asteroid is actually composed of. And then this will also be the, our first time to use Hall thrusters, which are um, electric propulsion thrusters beyond lunar orbit. So um, it's a very, I think it's a really cool mission to be part of. Um, so just comparing the size of Psyche um, and this top photo, you can see it compared to other kind of more famous asteroids, best in series and also compared to our own moon and then and, you know, Earth for scale as well. It, it, it's fairly small um, as far as, well, I guess it's the 10th largest asteroid, <laughs> but it's still really small, you know, compared to our moon or the Earth. Um, and where it is in the asteroid belt, like its eccentricity and everything um, makes it pretty easy to access um, using solar electric propulsion along our trajectory. Um, let's see, what else? Yeah, so, so we're basically just trying to, to learn more about how this was formed. Um, and I think anything that we find out, it's going to be interesting because this is a very unique body from everything that we, that we know about it so far. Um, so this picture was actually taken in our PI's backyard with her own personal telescope, and the red dot is, um, is Psyche. So uh, we actually don't know a lot about what it looks like. This is our best images that we've been able to, that other scientists have been able to get. Um, and so you can tell like a basic shape model, but for the most part, it, it's really a blur. Um, and so, you know, this is what we're using to go off of, you know, when we were planning our orbits around this asteroid, typically you, you have a good shape model of the body that you're orbiting and it's, you know, gravitational variations. But this one, we're going to have to kind of start with what we know and then adapt as we fly and as we learn more about, about the body. And then also just for reference, it's about you know, the size from LA to San Diego. All right, so our science objectives. Um, the first one is to determine whether Psyche is a core or if it's unmelted material. Um, secondly, determine the relative ages of Psyche's surface regions. Um, objective C, determine the global abundances 
in portions of the psyche surface that appear to be of metal phase of these light elements. Uh, I think it's silicon, potassium, and sulfate. Maybe mix those up. Um, and then objective B, determine whether psyche was formed under more oxidizing or more reducing conditions than Earth's core. And E is to characterize psyche's topography. So I'll also just note here that a mission like this, and, and really all JPL and, and space missions, have a very strong science team and a very strong engineering team. And so, you know, we, no one can know everything. So engineers really rely on the scientists to tell us like what we should be looking for, what sort of science instruments we need to use. Um, and the scientists tell us, you know, what their goals are. And so the engineering responsibility is to build a spacecraft that can meet these goals. But there's a lot of back and forth. You know, sometimes engineers say, we can't, we can't do that, or like, that's not possible. Or if you, if we do this, then we can't do that. And so, you know, it's a ton of teamwork, um, working between the scientists and engineers and really trying to understand each other and understand each other's um, pain points and, and objectives. So, so a lot of teamwork goes into this. Um, so then our science goals are to understand a previously unexplored building block of planet formation, um, iron cores. Um, look inside the terrestrial planets, including Earth, by directly examining the interior of a differentiated body, which otherwise could not be seen. And then, you know, ultimately explore this new type of world. Um, we've never explored a, a world made, made of metal. We've only looked at rocky or icy planets. So this will be a very novel mission, regardless of what we find. And then here you can see um, some renderings of our science payload. So the first is the imager on the left. And um, we carry two of these to be redundant on the spacecraft in case one of them um, goes out for any reason. And also they're actually mounted at cant angles, um, tilted in toward each other about three degrees, which can, if we turn both images, imagers on at the same time, provide some additional perspective and you know 3D topography. Um, next, we have two magnetometers, um, also for redundancy. And then we have um, our gamma ray and neutron spectrometers. This one, we only have one of each of these science instruments. Um, we couldn't accommodate um, backups, but these are really reliable and have been used on space missions in the past. So hopefully, fingers crossed, nothing happens to them. <laughs> All right, so talk a little bit about this, um, you know, how we would discover if Psyche is a core or not. Um, it might be, you know, formed by the outside in or inside out, or it might be a pile of rubber, rubble, or it might be nothing at all. You know, we'll, we'll figure it out once we get there. Um, you know, objective B is imaging the planet. Um, and then this is just a, an example of some of the data that our gamma ray neutron spectrometers might, you know, provide back to us and the limits at which we would determine whether psyche is a core or if it's, you know, some other type of body. Um, and then we want to characterize the morphology of the planet. So um, these are examples of other past missions to Ceres and Vesta from the Dawn mission. Some of the, you know, mapping that they were able to produce of those asteroids was very detailed. Um, so this is about the size of our spacecraft. Um, looking top down at the arrays deployed. Um, and another view of what's included. So um, I pointed out, let's see, where's my pointer? We have our gamma ray spectrometer and neutron spectrometer, spectrometer on beams, um, as well as the magnetometers. And so this is really to get these instruments away from the bulk of the spacecraft, away from um, like heat and any um, like signals or other things that could be going on inside the spacecraft that could actually um, interfere with the science being collected. Like there's been a large effort, for example, for the magnetometers to demagnetize a lot of the other um, engineering units in the body of the spacecraft so that the magnetometers are only picking up magnetic signals from space and not from the spacecraft itself. Um, so we have our high gain antenna, um, DSOC is a deep space optical communications tech demo that we're going to be testing out, seeing, um, you know, using laser communications to communicate um, as, as opposed to regular antennas. 
So this hasn't been done before in deep space, but we're gonna test it out. And if it's successful, we'll be able to use it on future missions as well. And we have our cameras poking out here um, and uh, our set of Hall effect thrusters or um, solar, let's see, SPT. I think it's solar plasma thruster. Hmm. I don't remember the acronym, <laughs> but those are the Hall effect thrusters. All right, so we actually partnered with Maxar Space Technologies, formerly FSL, um, to build a spacecraft because they have a lot of experience building electric propulsion spacecraft. They've sent over 30 spacecraft into low Earth orbit. Um, and so they have a ton of heritage um, in that field. And so we wanted to you know, utilize them as our main supplier um, but JPL has a ton of experience in deep space missions. So especially when it comes to fault protection and software and um, computer systems. So um, this partnership has been a big strength for us in this mission. Um, and so there's been some advances in solar electric propulsion that, have, that we're gonna be utilizing and leveraging on the Psyche spacecraft. Um, using the SPT-140 thrusters um, for our spacecraft. And so here's just some spec differences between what's been used in the past on other deep space missions, such as Deep Space One and Dawn, and then some improvements you know, that we have um, this time around. So here's a, a mission overview. Um, we're planning to launch in August of 22, which is really soon <laughs> in terms of aerospace years. Um, and so we'll, we'll launch from Earth and then we will spend 90 days doing an initial checkout, just checking out all the systems, doing some functional tests, making sure everything looks good. Um, we'll also be testing out our DSOC operations during this time. Um, I'll also point out that there's periods of optimal thrusting and optimal coasting. So this gray bar shows when we're thrusting and when we're not. So for example, as we're approaching Mars and doing our flyby, it's actually more optimal the trajectory for us to turn our thrusters off and just be pulled in by Mars and then use that as a slingshot to continue along our journey. And so um, in 2026, we'll arrive at Psyche, which is kind of crazy to think about. We're like building and testing right now, but we actually won't get to operate it and collect science for five more years. <laughs> Um, and I have a series of science orbits where we'll do, we'll use different instruments as the prime. You know, we'll have them on all the time nominally, but um, each one has its own focused orbit so that we can really focus on getting the data down from that specific instrument. Um, and we also need to arrive at Psyche by a certain time so the lighting conditions are ideal. Um, so by the time that we end our orbital operations, um, the surface is mostly going to be in shade just because of where it is um, in its year around the sun. Um, and so by the time we end, we're in about 60% um, of the surface is going to be lit. So we have to make sure we get all of our science objectives met um, by the end of orbital operations in 2027. Here's another view of the four science orbits, A, B, C, and D. Um, different altitudes above the surface, different inclinations, um, just for, you know, making sure we have the best lighting conditions and, um, you know, util measuring the science that we need at the appropriate altitude um, with respect to the spacecraft, I mean, with respect to Psyche. Um, so here's just like where we are in the development. You know, the first concept for this mission was back in 2011. Um, so this just kind of tells you about how long it takes to get these missions off the ground. Um, it took several years just to, you know, maybe start forming a team and get more of a mission concept in place. Um, and so then even for NASA missions, these are all competed. So um, different NASA centers and scientists will put together proposals and submit them to NASA headquarters to be selected. And usually it takes a few rounds to get selected, but Psyche was special and got selected on its first attempt. Um, and so, you know, these first 
couple years are just a proposal and competition phase. And then once you're selected, the real fun begins. Um, so we are here. Um, we just completed CDR last spring. And so we are in the middle of building and testing right now, um, which is you know where all the fun bugs come out and you get to start playing with hardware, which is a lot of fun. Um, launching in 2022, and then, like I said, arriving in, in 2026. Uh, we have a lot of great partners that we're working with. So Arizona State University is where our main, our, our PI, our lead scientist is, is from. And so, um, you know, she, ASU is technically the, the manager of this mission. Um, JPL is the engineering manager and, and lead systems engineering support for the mission. Maxar is our main um, bus supplier, and then our instruments are being um, developed by the Applied Physics Lab out of Johns Hopkins, um, Malin Space Systems, and DTU, which is um, a technical university in the Netherlands. They're making our magnetometers. So lots of partnerships, um, lots of teams. I think there's about 800 team members on Psyche overall, and that's a small mission for NASA. Um, okay, so then just to wrap up, we have a lot of really great student collaborations that I wanted to share with you all if it's of interest. So um, I'll send you all some, I'll show you some links at the end of this where you can get involved, but um, we partner with universities to, um, for students to be involved in capstone projects. Um, there's something called Psyche Inspired where undergrads can, um, you know, be inspired by our mission by Psyche through creative works. Um, I've seen some music, musical compositions um, inspired by Psyche or even dance performances. So it, it's really cool, um, the outreach that the team is doing with these students. Um, we also have something called Innovation Toolkit, which are free online courses um, that teach anyone, um, you know, critical skills in um, space exploration. There's a lot of, um, we have interns who engage, you know, K through 12 locally, and we have publicly available materials for outreach to teach people about our mission. Um, and then we also have a team of people who currently, like their job is to manage and evaluate our outreach efforts and make sure that we're reaching the public and, and doing a great job educating people um, on our mission and about space. Um, and then of course, you know, there's a lot of publications um, that our engineers and students um, are constantly putting out there. Um, okay, so there's a video about the capstone overview projects. I think I won't play this yet. If we have time, I'll come back to it. But if you want to look it up yourself, um, it's called the NASA Psyche Mission Undergraduate Capstone Project. You can find it on YouTube and interview students about you know their experience um, working on these Psyche inspired capstone projects. Um, and as I was mentioning, these are just a few examples of some of the art that's come out of our Psyche Inspired program. Um, and I think that you, if you go to this website, you can apply to be part of Psyche Inspired. Um, and then this is um, a little more information about the online toolkit, the online courses that the team has put together. Um, again, searching YouTube for ASU Psyche Online Course, you can find a video and more information there to learn more. Um, other ways to get involved, so, you know, we're on social media. Um, we have some interactive activities and 3D models that you can download. Um, mission team blogs, a lot of the engineers and scientists have wrote, excuse me, written blog posts um, about their work on the mission, which um, gives you, like, really good insight into what different types of engineers and scientists actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. And so that is Psyche, a journey to a metal question mark world. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's all I had in my presentation. I wanna leave some time for any other like questions or, or discussion. If there is any. Thank you very much, Ashley. Really appreciate the talk. Yeah, thank you. 
uh, feel free to, you know, reach out if you want to learn anything else. Um, if you want to learn more about JPL or um, happy to, you know, give you all mentoring advice or advice about, you know, career opportunities, et cetera. So feel free to reach out. My email address is there. I do have a quick question about, um, I guess, the core of this planet uh, or of this, yeah. uh, of this ast asteroid, of this, uh, of this comet? Body. Body. <laughs> That works. Um, so you, it, one of the demonstrations was what looked like a heat map from the inside out. Is there supposed to be, is there like a, is there any sort of hypothesis about some sort of like liquid body on the inside of this or some liquid metal on the inside of this or no? Um, I'm going to try to answer this as a non-scientist. <laughs> But I believe what this is trying to show is that there's two different ways that cores can form. Um, one is from the outside in. And I think that means that it melts, that like the metals and elements melt down from the outside in and then cool. I think that's what the first one is showing. And that in that scenario, you'll typically find a higher nickel content. So that's the signature that we would be looking for with our instruments. And the second one is where it kind of heats and cools from the inside out. You would typically find, you know, less nickel content. Um, and the third, third image is that this could actually just be a pile of rubble and meaningless and not a core at all, <laughs> or it could be something completely different. So there's like a whole world of science when it comes to asteroid compositions and how planetary cores form. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in that, but there's a ton of literature, um, you know, on that arena uh, regarding this hypothesis. Very cool. Is there any data that, that sways for Psyche to be either way? Um, like, it, we, yeah, I, I guess just do, do people think it's going to be one, more of one or the People are really, uh, you know, a lot of our chief scientists really don't know. Um, there's no, you know, we really don't have data or some of the data that we've collected over the years, not, not us, but maybe other scientists um, give conflicting information. It, it's just so hard because it's so far away. There's, there's very little information that we can really get from just like imaging something so far away with our telescopes. So we really don't know. I mean, I, I think that our scientists would love to find that this is a core. Um, that would just be so cool and so unique. But regardless, because it has such a high metal content, it's definitely something novel and interesting. So I think they'll be excited for whatever they find out. But you know, at this point, um, yeah, we just don't have enough science data until we actually go there and start taking some of these measurements. Anyone else have any questions or comments? All right, well, um, Ben and Cody, if, if that's it, I'll um, stop sharing my screen and I hope you all enjoyed this presentation today. Um, yep. And yeah, like I said, feel free to reach out. Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. Uh, uh, very informative. And uh, <laughs> uh, there are some students who I think would have wanted to come to my class, so we'll have it on our YouTube for that. Um, but yeah, thank you.